posting. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome again to the meeting of the Open Worm developers. Um, being streamed live on YouTube from multiple countries, uh, from Russia, i.e. Siberia, from, uh, where are you now? Edinburgh? From Edinburgh, Scotland, yes. From Cork, Ireland, from Sardinia, Italy, from London, UK, and from San Diego, California. All right, um, so the agenda today, I have shared a couple times Times and links there. Balash, who just showed up, I will share again. Um, one thing I notice about the on-air stuff is that um, nobody on YouTube can see the agenda, so um, yeah. they can't. They also Unless you share your screen, maybe. Or, or so, I was, so I am sharing my screen. Um, let's see the screen am I sharing? All right. Great. Um, so people see that. All right, great. Um, so this uh, this last week was a little rough for me, uh, so I apologize I didn't get to actually scheduling a couple of things I wanted to. So I kind of cut and paste the agenda from last time, uh, but there are some updates on my side, but I just kind of wanted to walk through the updates from last time and for the purposes of uh, kind of catching up and maybe <laughs> delegating some of the things in terms of scheduling some things that, uh, that I'm uh, I'm kind of falling a little short on. Um, so the first is this muscle cell data meeting. Um, I think this speaks to kind of Balash and Alex, who are both not yet here. Um, I don't think Mike will be joining us today because of the rescheduling. So um, I think that that one's going to have to be on me for real this time. So we don't need to happen. Uh, synapse position meeting also did not occur. Um, this last, in the last uh, two weeks. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Sergey if there's any chance that uh, you actually picked up the slack uh, of me not scheduling this and if, any, if there was anything new there. So I wanted to maybe start with Sergey. Um, any chance there's, uh, you had a chance to look more at that database that had the synapse positions in it? Oh, sorry, no. <laughs> okay, that's all right. Well, we're in the same boat. Um, so, okay. okay. So, I spent so on this page. On, on SPH. Okay, well, that's good stuff too anyway. So, um, Stephen to send mail to make this. Okay, so um, another thing that we were going to do with Mike was to get muscle cell and SPH stuff going. I think that happened, but let's, let's then drop down and, and talk about the SPH stuff. So, um, last time we heard that uh, GPU, CPU, SPH versions were working identically and without errors, which is great. Um, Asked to talk a little bit about the time step, just to understand what that was. Sergey had been starting to port the code into Java before in performance. Sergey was going to help Andre commit the new SPH code into GitHub. So, gentlemen, how how are we doing now? Uh, it's all work. Uh, we done all of this. Done with which part? Uh, uh -huh. First and second part. Uh, Sing it up. And uh, yes, we had a yes. meeting with Sergey this week, me, Mahler, yeah. and Sergey. And that's all done. Uh, I am working on refactoring some of the uh, Java code. And we agreed with Sergey uh, that I was going to do that. Uh, and it is currently doing other stuff. Maybe I'll, I'll let him say what he's doing. But all that stuff is done anyway. And we had a few meetings with Matteo and Sergey this week on that. On that. Sweet. So where's the uh, where's the ported where's the ported code on GitHub? So it's uh, in the SPH solver repository. So GitHub.com open worm. So this may also educate people who are wondering what this is all about. This is our and code repository. Um, so it's under what here? No. Nope. It's C++ version. Simulation engine. This one? org.openworm.simulationengine.model? Java? No. No? Simulation engine.sph.solver or something like that. Okay, that's the other find a repository under Openworm. Yeah. That one. Yeah, the first one. Third. 
Okay, cool. It says it's C. It does. It says it's C. That's interesting. Okay. There's C the code. There's the OpenCL files. So oh, nice. there is some C code. Right. Nice. Look at that. Delicious. Um, and so this is a this is a now an actual um, OSGI bundle. Or yes. Yes. Brilliant. Uh, Sergey did most of the work. Uh, I I did some ref started some refactoring that it's not finished. Wow. It's all the unit tests are passing, and so we're happy enough. And it's all it's all in like Maven Maven path styling, which is beautiful. There's the magic. There's the magic class. Wow, all sorts of uh, CL, CL buffer. Okay, right. So we're so this is with the um, the Java CL, right? That's yeah. Nice stuff, guys. Brilliant. Um, okay. Um, sounds like a victory for two weeks uh, just by itself. So um, that was nice. Hope Sergey to do that, and then with a few meetings. Uh, basically, I don't know. I know, don't know if I'm ju jumping too far ahead, but ahead, but do you want me to talk about what's the plan with that? Yeah. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, uh, I mean, Sergey, that sounds like the main thing that you did, right? Pretty much. We go. I was just asking if that was if Sergey had anything else. Sorry, I did not hear. Uh, can you repeat? <laughs> okay, I was just saying. Do you think that we're that uh, that we're we're done with your updates? Then, I mean, obviously, that's a, that's a huge thing. So. Any anything else, Sergey? Ah. I think I can um, add uh, about our common work. Um, except this, we uh, started uh, to um, work in two directions. Um, I have um, uh, started to add um, uh, elastic matter to the simulation, and Sergey in parallel. Um, started to implement uh, PCI SPH, um, which is uh, necessary to make uh, better performance, and um, it should be it should be compatible uh, with uh, Elastic Matter. We have um, analyzed different uh, weak places of uh, this algorithm. Um, it should be okay. So, um, is that on the C on the C code side? Uh, first version, yes, uh, because uh, we need to debug this code. Uh, we can debug only with Intel uh, OpenCL debugger, which works only on C++ and Visual Studio. Okay, great. Um, then working this via Visual Studio um, for debugging. Okay, so do I have that right? So you've been improving SPH so that you can both do the elastic matter as well as the liquid, which it does pretty easily, but you need to you need to code it up and be sure that it can do both at the same time. Is that right? Andre? Um, I'm not sure that I completely understand the statement. Uh, oh, I was just, um, I just was putting into the, um, uh, do you see in the uh, agenda where I've highlighted? Yes. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Did I write that down correctly? Okay. Uh, I have seen it in share screen, not in the. Um, oh right, right, right. Sorry. I, I can try. I'll, I'll I'll bring the share screen back. Sorry. Uh, I'm trying to too, probably. Here, this part. I want to confirm that that's. Yeah, the first statement is uh, is fine. Been working. Yes. Okay. Uh, and. Um, 
One more thing, uh, Sergey was uh, working on uh, implementation of uh, PCI SPH um, as um, an update for current uh, ordinary SPH to make uh, liquid uh, incompressible. Okay. Great. So, um, so question for you. Um, we've seen a um, we've seen the demo of SPH that um, that has the the liquid sloshing around, and then we've seen the demo with the Jello cubes falling and bouncing. And so, um, so now is it are we going to be able to see a demo that has both water sloshing around and Jello cubes falling onto each other and interacting with each other? Yes. Cool. I would love to see that demo. Uh, that, would, that, would, that would be awesome. <laughs> and even better, I'd love to play with that demo. Um, yes. You know, locally, so. It would be great. I mean, I know there's a readme missing from the um, uh, GitHub repository. It would be great to be able to set up these um, uh, OSGI bundles in some very easy, simplified way just to actually run this and run an example. Yes. 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 For <coughs> the continual voice of the of, of the outside user and the voice of reason. Keep, keep pushing that. We need to keep pushing us to, to be able to do that because we're doing really great stuff. Um, but uh, but I, I I I think I agree. But Giovanni, yep. Sorry. The original code that Andre put together is now in GitHub. It's older than the OSGI, the, the Java port thing. So it's it's all in there. In theory, you can try it, but. I mean, in order to for it to work, you have to replicate the environment. So the water sample, I I didn't try, but I've seen that the code is in there now, and so it, we have that at least. That's the one. Get, this one. Yes. Okay. Okay. I think that's it. Is it? Is that it, Andre? Nice. This, this is all files. You got your own. You got your own GitHub account, Andre. Yay! <laughs> awesome. Yes, no uh, there, are, there are many branches uh, in this repository. You can use uh, different. It's uh, PCI SPH neighbor, new neighbor search, and original version of SPH. Cool. Uh, you can work with uh, different. Okay. That's nice. The SPH yeah. is not working yet. It's just. Can I have to um, teach me how to branch stuff from GitHub? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I've only played with other people's branches. I haven't. I haven't done any branching myself. Um, I think when you're the owner of the repository, you can do it. Uh -huh. Anyway, yeah, it, 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 you create a branch locally and then you push it to the remote. Uh, you do that too. Yeah. So um, anybody who's watching this, uh, you know, out there, you know, get in here and uh, you know, download this code and try it out and let us know if there's any uh, challenges uh, building it or what whatnot. Um, but that's awesome. Yeah, I think GitHub is gonna is gonna serve us really well as a platform. Um, I think Google Code was was great to start off with, but I, I really like the social the extra social uh, features of, uh, of GitHub. So. Awesome. Uh, just one thing: uh, if um, somebody will uh, would like to play with this code, there is one variable uh, which um, sets up um, which type of um, computational unit to use: GPU or CPU, uh, zero or one. Um, we should uh, just you can uh, ask me about how to use it uh, by uh, mail. Put it in the meeting. I mean, it, 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 am I correct in assuming that it needs um, Visual C++ to uh, build this? Uh, I think you can use uh, any other C++ uh, computer. OK. There isn't a make file, is there? No, no. OK. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, just some very brief instructions on how to build it. How to, um, I mean, the information about changing that flag would be great. Okay, we'll work on it. 
Okay, thanks. Um, this is um, the text um, which should be found um, to find this variable. I have typed it in the group chat uh, here okay. in this window. Apply so it. this uh, this variable um, can be uh, okay. yes, that's right. Thanks. Uh, so um, the program uh, uh, displays uh, which um, unit uh, it uses, um, but you can uh, see it only when it uh, started. So if if you have both both types uh, by switching zero one or otherwise, you can uh, change uh, this. Okay. Um. So well, that's great. Uh, great stuff. I do think uh, both comments are, are good, good ones. It make sure that the outside world can access it. Um, but uh, but being on GitHub is a huge uh, step forward towards that. So at least the code thing, and uh, we can work on that part as well in the future. I know that um, the last version of SPH, you know, the, the previous versions of SPH, um, you know, when you look at the analytics for who's hitting. Uh, the project, a lot of them come in Google searching for like Java implementations of, of SPH. So I know there's an interest, so um, that should drive us and motivate us to make sure that it's it's easy um, to, to use and build and all that. Stuff. All right, um, awesome. So sounds like a lot of well, let's keep going on the theme of, of SPH stuff. So Sivani, um, Matteo, you guys want to talk about from your perspective? And basically, for uh, what we've been doing is, is like um, Giovanni already said about the refactoring that is uh, doing for um, SPH. All right. Now, the all the things that I'm about to say are to basically reach a goal, having the SPH demo that we've seen. Uh, on the on the demo that Andre was showing in the simulation engine, so that we basically have the full loop working. We can have the simulation happening server side, uh, that simulation getting streamed to a web browser, and basically see it happening. Now, in order to do that, there are uh, uh, a couple of things that we need to do. The mm, one roadblock we were having was Java CL not working with uh, OSGI and uh, s uh, since two days now that roadblock doesn't exist anymore thanks to Olivier Shafik who has done a fantastic job supporting us we now do have um, the original neuronal solver that Jovan uh, wrote using uh, JOCL we have now that same solver working using Java CL. And why this is a great news, we all know, but just to reiterate it for uh, even for people looking, is that now we'll be in a position where we can basically deploy the simulation engine on any environment without having to basically deal with all the hassle of setting up the native libraries on different on Mac, on Windows, on Linux. Basically, Java CL does a so can you great job. Can, I just pa can we just pause there? Um, I, I was I was copying some of the traffic with this person who helped us out here, but I, I wanted to kind of give them some credit and like link to their link to their stuff. So this person has a has a GitHub page somewhere, right? Can can you paste it in in the chat and then just kind of yeah. say so who, who that guy is and what? Yeah, uh, it's Olivier Shafik. I'm giving you the link in about a second. Olivier Shafik. I think they have both. I think they did the same thing we did. They had a Google code repository, and then they moved all the code into GitHub, but they still have documentation on Google code. So myself posted the GitHub. I posted the Google code. OK, and so this is, the, this is basically the developer of Java CL. This is the developer of Java CL that basically um, helped us 
with uh, getting Java CL integrated with uh, OSGI, which means that uh, now it can be used and it actually works. I uh, at the moment is just on my machine, but it works. <laughs> so basically, if you remember the old uh, demo, uh, where basically we have the neuronal simulation stream to a um, web browser, now we have that working, but using Java CL. So that was uh, one of the first steps that we needed in order to move forward, to, in order to reach the goal I was saying earlier. The other thing is uh, we need a front end that, of course, is capable of displaying the simulation of um, SPH particles. And uh, we had a start, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, I was showing a uh, a start for that, and there is in GitHub uh, a bundle called uh, Simulation Engine dot Frontend, and uh, which uses uh, Java uh, WebGL. Sorry. And uh, now another thing that Sergey was doing uh, uh, and, and is currently doing is to basically look at the front end since he had the um, previous experience with uh, OpenGL uh, setting up the 3D rendering for the SPH simulation. Basically, we want to um, become familiar with WebGL and make sure that we get in a position where we can do all the things that we were doing with uh, OpenGL in uh, WebGL as well. And um, uh, so there is that. Now, in order to close the loop, uh, the refactoring that Giovanni is doing uh, is basically to get in a position where we can have the SPH model coming out uh, from uh, an XML file which defines what is the model that we want to simulate. So instead of having all the particles instantiating inside the code, these particles would be coming from the outside as a file. So the solver won't have any more a notion of what you stimulate because it instantiates, it just receives it from the outside as it should be. So one thing that I did in these two weeks was to basically get in a position where this could happen by writing a, a small, uh, say, utility that creates uh, this XML for us. Starting basically, I took the code that was inside the solver that uh, Sergey and Andre were using in order to create all the particles, and I create a small module that creates an XML out of it, and uh, it's six max that I want to send it, but I'm just pasting uh, uh, some of it on the chat, so that is uh, an XML that is compliant to the schema that we defined months ago with uh, Andre and Sergey, and it basically defines all the particles. Now, wh where I'm going with this, imagine this XML, which is the input, uh, makes its way to the solver. The solver now uses Java CI, so it can be used on any machine. So we're solving that with the test uh, um, that uh, Sergey wrote for SPH. We link that to what Giovanni was working on in terms of streaming, which uh, we're still waiting for a Virgo version that will support uh, the latest uh, 27 of Tomcat, where WebSocket is enabled. Once we have that, uh, then we have a solver, uh, which can basically uh, perform the computation, sends back the result to this uh, simulation bundle. The simulation bundle can stream those results to a front end, the front end that uh, myself and uh, Sergey are looking at. And basically, we start displaying those particles in a 3D engine. Uh, so these steps are surely going in the right directions. In order for that to happen, we still need to finish Virgo. Giovanni still needs to finish the refactoring, and I will be concentrating on the interface between the simulation bundle and the front end. Basically, we were looking yesterday uh, at a standard that can be used in order to uh, describe the scene, because basically the simulation will be streaming a scene to the front end, and we were, we were looking at X3D as a standard that can be used uh, in order to do this. So basically, define a scene graph uh, uh, where you basically create all the particles and stream those particles as part of a scene uh, for each time step. The front end uh, with its engine would be receiving these. We still have to decide uh, what engine to use, if 3.js or x3dom. Uh, 
we really need to learn more about this too before making a call. But, so that 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 is <laughs> in a bit of a <laughs> meatball what we did and what we need to do in order to get there. And uh, we plan also to integrate the um, neural simulation with this, uh, the, the sample neural simulation that we have at the moment with this new streaming uh, rendering engine and move out from what was previously there just for that purposes. Interesting. Okay, a lot of okay, a lot of things. So one is, um, wh where can I find the schema for that um, for that XML? It's checked in uh, GitHub. Uh, in uh, there is a bundle called the SPH dot model. Okay. Well, link to it uh, in the in the minute so that people can see it. Okay. While I'm looking for that, um, yeah. So the strategy for the three D. Um, do you think that, um, I, I think the challenge would be um, streaming a whole scene graph. Um, do you, are you concerned at all about uh, like the performance of copying the whole street scene graph and sending it over uh, to the front end? Uh, or have you, have you got very far on that? Or are you thinking about that part? Not worried. Not worried yet. <laughs> if, <laughs> if, if, <per> basically, <laughs> it, it all well, this is part of a uh, sort of test and research. I don't think there are that many people that at the moment streaming particle simulation from a server to a web browser. And uh, so I'm not worried. We'll see how it plays out. And then eventually, if we need to, we'll think of optimization we can introduce. But first, I want to hit the roadblock before um, basically thinking ahead. Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, you, can, you should build up to it. I, I do think having some experience with you know, thinking about this from the perspective of uh, the whole brain catalog that um, maybe some tricky things there. Um, and we may need to think about some more compressed compressed means of, of streaming stuff, like maybe yeah, sending that first and then sending updates, you know, to it in a more compressed way. But just because 3D tends to be, tends to demand, you know, 30 frames per second, 60 frames per second, pretty... Uh, Pretty intense, but anyway. Um, yeah, we can we can we can think of different things yeah. like uh, mm, you could buff. You have a buffer, so it might not be exactly what is being simulated on the server, but say what was simulated on the server five seconds ago. You build this buffer and then you start showing it, something like that. So you could have different things, and uh, it's like the, the, all of these basically uh, in order to um, have a. Proof of con uh, a bigger proof of concept of what we're building. Uh, surely, when we'll have the in, uh, X years time, when we'll have the full worm, surely we won't be streaming uh, the like millions of particles for the entire worm all the time. At that stage, you can basically uh, find an abstraction. Uh, you could derive a mesh out of the particles because, in a way, the topology should be the same, uh, and then you just basically it's stream the deltas that you are uh, obtaining as a result of the simulation. So it's like we'll, we'll worry as time goes by and as we hit this problem. We had, uh, we had a heated discussion about just just this <laughs> yesterday. Okay. Kind of run over 45 minutes just fighting about okay. this. Then, then we, won't, <laughs> we, won't, uh, we won't bring it back up here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we'll let that happen, but uh, but but do uh, you know do and do point out the next time you guys meet for this. Uh, send me out a, a reminder yeah. for when that it's is. It's always on the calendar. This was just me, Matteo, and Sergey, uh, but I think they invited hey, uh, it was on the calendar. Uh, but we'll we'll send it out to everyone maybe but, next yeah. time. But it it was on the calendar even this time. Yeah, yeah, it was. Maybe, yeah. maybe on the hangout we didn't invite people explicitly. Like. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's fine. I, I, I have seen it on the calendar, but I, I guess just this particular part of the conversation with this uh -huh. piece is, I, I don't know exactly when. I think there's going to be another one next next um, Wednesday or, or Thursday. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. And thanks to you guys, by the way, for, you know, taking the lead on, on getting those uh, sessions organized and, and set up. Um, that's huge help, and... You know, the more that that happens, I think the more this is uh, a self-organizing system of a, of a project. So, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, another thing, I don't want to take too much time, but another thing that was done on the SPH stuff as part of the refactoring was actual work on the 
basically the version that uh, Andre and Sergey have in C++, it works uh, on CPU and GPU, but the ported version wasn't working on my CPU, and we tried it on Matteo's one as well. And so part of the refactoring was to get it to work on those CPUs, Intel CPUs. So, so yeah. that it's now working. It, it, it was just a matter of troubleshooting those minor, minor stuff. It was working on the GPU, but not on the CPU. On for me, uh, I don't know if it's working on other CPUs. So that that's done. Uh, Okay, awesome. So you made sure the GPU and CPU support work both for the for the ported version. For the ported, yes. Yeah. Because the other one was working on both. Awesome. Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, so do you mind? Do you have other other things on on your side that uh, separate from all the, those updates? Not that was pretty much the meetings and that refactoring. Was pretty much everything. So this uh, this piece from before with the uh, WebSocket streaming, that's part. We're waiting for Virgo to be to to be upgraded to the next version of Tomcat. Okay. As soon as that happens, we can we can stream. But in the meanwhile, we're working on at the interface, as Matteo was saying, defining what what is gonna be streamed. That's gonna take time just to define that. So we're doing that because it's gonna be independent. But the streaming is part. We have the examples and everything. Uh, we're just waiting for that to happen. And it's going to be soon. We just don't know if it's this month or next month, something like that. Is there any way that we can start some sort of a lobbying, lobbying campaign where we uh, where we all uh, up on mailing lists and beg them to, to do it? We could it. try. <laughs> we didn't do anything yet, just monitoring. Yeah, they, uh, 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 I will create uh, an account because you need an account to log a bug. It's not like uh, I mean, it's uh, an account and in Eclipse and as a committer, I, I will try to get in touch with someone one else to work on this stuff. One thing that I would say is that I don't know how everyone feels about it, but um, I think this guy Olivier Shafi actually contributed to the project more than, I mean, more than no normal, meaning it really helped, so I don't know if we want to put him on the contributor list or what. Uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that's a good idea. Hang on one second. Um, because if, if we put it there, then it is probably going to be easier. More, more probable that it is going to support us if there's other problems. Even gone. Even? Yes. Probably okay. gone. For a second. Sorry. Link. I'm back. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that. Um, so it's an interesting it's an interesting point, right? Because we touch a lot of different open source projects, and obviously we want to push forward some of the priorities that we that are relevant to us. Um, and at the same time, we obviously make those projects better by you know pushing and by contributing. Um, I, so um, just an idea. I think I mean it, that was a huge contribution. That, that's all. Uh, w w would be just nice to thank him, and maybe if not contributor, we can. S section somewhere on the website. People that that does along the way. I don't know. We, we need maybe to structure. Uh, do we link to Java CL as one of our technologies on the website? Yeah, maybe we could do that. Add, add that. Uh, that. That that actually <laughs> help him more than uh, just pointing. Yeah, it's not there already. So it's just a small change. I'll do that. We'll do that, and I'll also um, I'll also send an email um, on behalf of all of us. I'll CC you all as well. Uh, just doing, making an extra step to reach out and say thank you for the for the help on that. Do you have his uh, personal email? Yeah. Oh okay. no, I mean I don't. Sorry, I don't know his personal email. I think it's the same that's on that uh, thread. Uh, I, I I have. Yeah, I'll we'll get it to you. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. So let me put a note there. So send. 
Okay, send, we'll send special links. We'll add Java CL as a open one. Okay, great. Um, where are we at now? Okay, so next, um, I'll see. Um, I'm jumping around here a little bit. Let's let's lead me to the end. Um, Borg, anything uh, anything new on your side? So before we had talked about Python API for NeuroML uh, and uh, attending multi-scale modeling program on cells and tissue. Uh, anything new there? Um, not, uh, haven't been able to do a hell of a lot, unfortunately, in the last uh, two weeks. Um, I did attend that meeting in Stockholm. Um, there were a number of people there from various different multi-scale modeling initiatives. Um, no concrete outcomes yet, but they're going to be looking for input on different scenarios for multi-scale modeling, so interaction with vasculature, um, interaction modeling individual spines and linking that to large-scale uh, neuronal models, generating local field potentials from these smaller scale models, and so there may be some outcomes of that and some workshops, but uh, nothing concrete. I mentioned the odd time, open worm, um, but let's say, um, Otherwise, I've done a little bit on the um, C. Elegans Neural Construct project just to tidy it up a little bit, but there is still uh, a lot more to be done as far as um, just double checking all the connections. I still need to um, optimize Neural Construct for making sure that the uh, connections are as close as possible and uh, are the most sensible connections between different cells. Uh, I haven't done anything about the data club, uh, the, data club the database, which um, the new database of connections. So hopefully, yeah, I, um, so I'll reach out. I'll reach out on that. Let's get Kevin. Yeah. Like on that. Um, otherwise, not too much else in the break. So who who is starting to think about vasculature and, and spines? Um, well, I think that was just raised as one of the um, scenarios uh, for interaction with. Well, basically what we were trying to come up with was um, some scenarios to show the types of multi-scale modeling which needed to be done and were interesting to do, and then we're going to try to come up with lists of uh, who's actually doing that, what tools are out there, what uh, maybe standardization is needed for exchanging these, if we're exchanging meshes of detailed micro um, anatomical features and so on. Mm. So, Any squishy uh, tissue type thing come up that SPH might be relevant to? Not so much. Um, not really. I mean, it, a lot of it was down to kind of modeling um, individual spines and, but also um, people looking at the kind of um, theoretical ideas behind multi-scale modeling for if you do have models on different physical scales, different time scales, how best to link these together, how best to substitute a uh, very detailed synapse model into a multi-compartmental model and so on. Um, so hopefully there will be some output. I mean, one of the suggestions was a, a wiki which just explained these concepts and just listed who's doing what and what's available for these scenarios. So well, did, did that actually get produced? Is there a page somewhere? Uh, that was one of the, um, so the actual outcome of it was um, the multi-scale modeling program will recommend to the IMCF board uh, what it should do in future, what its future work should be. Um, one of the things it will recommend is these small things, forming small groups to come up with these wikis or just list what's out there, list projects that are out there. I think they said that they had recorded a lot of the presentations. There were people there presenting from IBM, uh, James Kozlowski and the Neural Tissue Simulator and a few people from Blue Brain Project and a number of others. And I think they said the videos for those presentations would go online, so some of them were quite interesting. Uh, so if you hunt through the INCF website, you may find some of these. Cool. Very good. Um, and then uh, any news on the um, 
Uh, this is kind of more for Mike, but this may have also crossed your radar on the, um, the multi-compartmental Python API. Uh, that Mike's working away on that. There's actually a meeting in London um, on, next Monday, Monday week, Monday and Tuesday. For Andrew uh, Dixon, Mike, uh, Mike Hall, and Michaela Mattioni are coming along, and we're going to have a chat about that uh, with a view towards getting a kind of uniform API in Python for working across simulators like uh, Neuron, uh, Moose, and anything else, and hopefully make it nice and compatible with uh, NeuroML and with Pine. So it's a little bit off, but um, a little bit. There's a lot of work to be done, but um, Mike is doing some good initial work on representing efficiently um, default morphologies and true Python. Awesome. Okay. And I will link in as well to uh, some of the things uh, Stefan Gerhardt was also associated with that. And he's quite keen to get a a format that's nice and close to uh, HDR5, uh, which can dump <coughs> these very detailed reconstructions from CapMade into. Um, if this was all compatible with the rest, then that would be quite nice. Awesome. So on that point, um, so my my main update in terms of technical progress is that um, send emails back and forth with Stefan to try and explain exactly uh, what challenges we were running into. Uh, to review, um, we had been. Um, we want to get uh, this cat made thing, which lets you go through slices of worm tissue and and outline where the position of the synapses are, uh, and so that we can then take those positions and put them into the RML. We want to do this for some of the synapse positions that we don't have because the data that uh, Stephen Cook has shared with us is uh, <coughs> not complete. Uh, basically, because you know it's a hard problem to hunt down all these you know, seven thousand synapses and, and, and find where they should go. So, um, so we're trying to slowly, it's slowly but surely, um, put this up there. So anyway, the, the recent progress is that um, so um, there had been a project that had originally been contributed by uh, another gentleman, a friend of mine named uh, Rich Stoner, who would use some in, some install scripts to. You, you, it's kind of cool, actually. You're at you're at the command line on your machine, and you run one script. You you uh, you put in your Amazon uh, key information. And then you run one script, and it goes out to Amazon. It creates the instance for you. You didn't have to create the instance. It creates the right instance, the right Linux instance. And then it starts installing packages remotely on that server. Okay, And then it launches the servers. And then it just gives you back the URL of the machine that's like pre-configured with all this stuff. So Rich had done this, and he had uh, set it up for CatMade. Um, but his project had gotten out of date, uh, out of uh, step with the actual CatMade um, code because it was external to the code. So when I talked to Stefan, he brought it in to um, the, the CatMade code base as one of the scripts um, on one of the branches of CatMade. And then I worked with him to try and figure out what the actual goal was. So he reported back to me this week, and this is finally the actual update, uh, this week that he now has that working again with the new version of CatMade so that we can go to the command line put in our, you know, the open worm account uh, for the, the credits that we got from, from Amazon. Thank you again, Amazon, for giving us credit. Um, and um, and we can launch this instance of CatMate up there. Now, I haven't tested it yet, admittedly, so because uh, this just came in like two days ago. Um, but uh, but thank you, Amazon. Thank you, Stefan, for doing the legwork to get this thing working. Um, and, and now we've actually also made a contribution back to the CatMate project because now other people can launch CatMate instances in this way. Now, CatMate is still evolving. Uh, my understanding is that they don't recommend it in use or in production use. There's still some things dealing with user registration and stuff, which is basically some flat files. And, but that's fine. Like um, anyway, we're I still am interested to try it out, test it out, and see you know what our next challenges are. So this will then uh, merge in with what we're doing with the Synapse Position database that Stephen Cook gave us. Remember that database is actually the database of a different system. It's not. CatMade. It's a system that um, had been evolved in the lab that he's part of, uh, the Emmons lab. Um, and um, uh, so um, so it's a little bit of a different schema that we'll have to use. But nonetheless, I think it's important that we have ability to, to translate both. And then I also understand that CatMade does have some NeuroML support already built in. Is that right, uh, Pori? Um, I think you can export in SWC format, and I think you can also export in a 
form of HDF5 and I, I think his preferred um, yeah, his, his preference would be that the HDF5 format, th that there would be a version of um, NeuroML which was compatible with the HDF5 format, uh, which would be his, exper his preferred export format. I mean, it's probably too much data to export in, ex in uh, XML text. Uh, so, I mean, it's an initial um, export format that they have, and if we could update the preferred NeuroML format with that, then that would be everyone's preferred okay. solution. <laughs> okay, well, so um, so anyway, it's so it's um, NeuroML is still the uh, the interling in interlingua here that we all want to be working with, and so as we move forward, we may you know maybe be able to flesh out some of that conversion um, yeah. for the synapse position pieces. Don't know exactly how it is there at the moment, but um, yeah, but that's I mean great. then the key no, the big thing then will be the integration of if you have NeuroML coming from a cathode and somebody is re constructed different cells, uh, trying to get that to link into the kind of existing um, NeuroML connectome uh, and update synapses. And if one is there, it has a better location through Capnate, that's great. Uh, but if it's replicating, or if it's not, if it's missing in the other, how do you actually get all that information to um, get merged? And how do you track where each synapse was? Um, source information on that and how useful it is. I mean, if somebody has manually um, gone in there and identified it, that's better than somebody has guessed it to the answer. Cool. Um, so anyway, so, so thanks to Stefan Gerhard for helping with that, and we'll be testing it and getting that working. Um, let's see. The other update that I have right from, uh, from the last two weeks is more relationship building. But um, there's this site, uh, basically the um, de facto reference for collecting uh, morphologies of neurons is a site that's called neuromorpho.org. Um, so I'm pasting, pasting that in here. So neuromorpho.org is a repository that's run by Giorgio Scoli. Um, he's a uh, researcher out of George Mason University. And he's been tirelessly maintaining this, uh, this repository for quite a while. Um, it also now has connections to, to NeuroML, but it also deals with many of the different formats in which people describe the shapes of neurons uh, in, in multiple organisms. Um, so the news uh, from this last couple of weeks is that um, I connected with Giorgio at a recent meeting and discussed the progress that we've been making with uh, the NeuroML uh, connectome, uh, you know, the spatial connectome of the, uh, of the C. elegans. And I said that, uh, you know, it's getting to a point pretty close now where probably we're ready to, um, to contribute a first version, an initial version of the uh, one back into Neuromorpho. And I don't think they have any C. elegans in there right now. Um, and this is going to be uh, you know, an interesting puzzle for them as well um, that may push their game forward a little bit because they're usually used to working with individual morphologies, like single, single cells. Um, and they don't as much work with uh, you know, large circuits, so they have like one or two examples. But, um, but uh, he thought that you know this that, that uh, what we've been doing would be a perfect example of pushing that forward. I think it will also be nice to have uh, that process started to to move that in there, um, uh, so that we can report it at the INCF meeting for our, our spotlight and also for a poster. To be able to say that not only have we done this, but we've also put it back in the morpho. And so anyway, so he's very excited to see it, and I just uh, it's on my list of to dos to um, send him a first version, and kind of just get started. And, see how he can open it up and, you know, maybe there's metadata that needs to be flushed out. But anyway, so uh, so that's kind of exciting. Um, and I think that's a good way to continue the, the community. And obviously, he'll, he'll point back to the open worm site, you know, from there, which would be nice. And, and so, yeah. Uh, OK. I think through a lot of that stuff. I can see also on this list um, travel costs. Uh, so I think that was also on my list to do. Um, okay, so uh, again, always with the, the Nova Severus connection. So um, it has been my goal for a long time to find a way that uh, we can bring this together, particularly the Siberian uh, contingent, uh, who 
Um, I feel like I know you guys um, like good friends, and yet uh, we've never actually met in person. Um, so um, my understanding at the moment is that Russia is still not officially part of the INCF. And because of the way that the INCF gives travel grants, we can only do so from a member country, uh, which is annoying um, in terms of our project, but understandable from, from their perspective and what they're trying to do. So I don't think travel grants will be possible. However, what I was talk what I was beginning to talk about at the beginning of this before I actually started broadcasting was the idea of this, uh, this excursion to Novosibirsk, um, which I am planning, uh, which is not as good as coming to the neuroinformatics meeting by far because there will be a lot of interesting connections uh, happening there. But I'm trying to see how many people I can rally to come with me. Um, so this is an open invitation. It would begin in October. Uh, it may, it's, it's um, my crazy friend wants to take the railway to get there, but uh, planes work too. Um, obviously, um, there are some visa issues to work out, but um, I'm getting closer and closer to um, kind of making the full commitment to starting the visa process. Um, so maybe have a little mini open war meeting in Novosibirsk uh, with uh, Andre, Sergey, and Alex hopefully be around. Um, I've been enticing Giovanni Matteo to come with me. Um, uh, the rest of you who think that uh, you know that might be fun, uh, please think about it as well. Uh, in the first two weeks of October, look at your schedules. Um, see what that might look like so that we can start converting um, we, can, we can continue that conversation offline as well. But um, at the moment, I think that's, that's maybe the best way um, to make it happen is, is I, think, I don't think it's going to be possible for, for me to coordinate any way to get those guys out. So then I think the next step is for me to go there and for us to, for us to go there. How many people can go there? So, um, so that's, that's kind of what's new with that part. Um, it may still be possible for travel grants for some of the, uh, the rest of you in, in European countries. Um, I was mainly working the, the Russia angle, um, didn't, didn't get as far as I'd like. But um, uh, please uh, email me on this subject um, afterwards uh, individually, um, you know, in terms of travel grants, so that'll help me push that part forward too. Um, okay? Oops. Great. Okay, um, so I now want to turn over to Balash, who is joining us. Uh, I've been carrying on a conversation with him uh, over email, and um, I wanted to like give him a chance to, to speak at length about uh, what he's doing and what's going with you. And okay, so um, I've been working on this uh, paper, which I uh, well, first it's just going to be obviously an internal paper, but. Uh, it's going to be titled the Turing test for CL, I guess, and, and it's good stuff, and I'm working on it quite hard, but uh, it's a little bit more time consuming than I initially uh, imagined it to be. But the main point that I really want to get across is, is very simple, and uh, namely that, uh, let's say, and I know that the project is not just there yet, but we will get to a point where we're going to have a working model and then uh, we can start to make some comparisons with the behavior of the real worm and I think that's when it's going to get really really exciting uh, but the point is is that we need to demonstrate that uh, our particular model is not just something that happens to behave the same way as the C elegance but our model actually captures some of the biophysical properties uh, of the real C elegance as well and by that I mean is that uh, we're going to have a lots of free parameters in the model. I, I know that Steven is working hard to get some electrophysiological data, but just to get all the relevant data is, is just going to be impossible. Um, we did get data, by the way. Um, yeah, I know that we did get some, but uh, as far as my understanding goes, uh, like uh, for each of the different muscle cells, there's going to be, uh, we, we would need to model them independently. Uh, I guess some of these muscle cells are going to behave very similarly to each other, but when I had this conversation with Netta Cohen, uh, she's, she's the one in Leeds and she's been working quite extensively. Well, for the past 20 years she's working in the C. elegans and um, 
yeah, she's been warning against that shortcut that not all not all the muscle cells of the CL ligands behave equally. But anyway, getting back to the point, uh, what I wanted to say is that we could have a model with, let's say, thousand models, uh, sorry, thousand neurons, which happens to behave the same way as the CL ligands. We have got 302 neurons and a vast parameter space associated with that model. So we need to perturb the system in one way or another uh, and, and to demonstrate that still the behavior of our wheelchair worm and the real worm are the same. The most obvious thing to do is to do some genetic modifications. And I've been in contact with Ian Hope, who is a C. elegans expert as well. He's also working in Leeds and we had these emails back and forth. And one of the, the big conclusion is that doing, doing anything, doing the modeling of a genetical modification is going to be extremely difficult, mostly because not even the people working on the genetics are, would not be 100% sure that what is going on within the organism. But another way that we can take, and the one that I think uh, that I would like to uh, put an argument for, is to go with the uh, uh, varying the environment. What we need to perturb is not just the worm itself, but we need to think of the, our system as the worm and the environment put together. Now, I don't know how many of you have been looking down in a, uh, in a microscope and actually see a C. elegans moving, but what's interesting is that uh, if you put it into a liquid medium, then it's going to have this uh, swimming motion. It's, it's basically, it's, it's one of these C shapes, and then, and then it, it makes a reverse C shape. It's, it's, it's quite rapid. It's, it's a little bit weird, but it's doing some swimming. But if you look it into uh, a dense gel uh, like agar, then what you're going to see is then this crawling motion. And what's interesting about this, that a few years ago there were a couple of labs, including Netta Cohen's lab, and they made experiments where they put the worm into uh, mediums with different uh, viscosity, varying between these two extremes of the agar and of the water. And what they see is that uh, there was this transition from the swimming to the crawling behavior. And what it, well, what they argue for, a, and well, there were three labs that made this experiment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-oh, we lose him? Maybe he's hanging out, crashing. Bummer, that was cool. I was getting excited about the auger versus uh, liquid thing because of the um, uh, in SPH we can like change the viscosity of the environment that uh, the thing is in, right? Pretty, pretty, pretty easily. Um, that's my understanding, anyway. It's just basically like set a different parameter and you've got different viscosity. Uh, so that um, that's maybe a way out in terms of running the full thing through there, but. Um, but that's an interesting possibility. Um, so it looks like he's out, crashed. I think he'll be back in a minute to begin um, uh, to, to, to kind of retake it. But, um, okay, I wanted to um, I wanted to go back to the sort of the, the overarching plan uh, real quick. Obviously, Mike's not here. Um, he was doing the install in the simulation engine locally, was meeting with the algae researcher. Uh, don't know how that went. And then Tim was looking at some of the Synapse info. Um, do you want to go back to kind of the high-level picture here of the stories uh, in with the scrum do environment? Uh, still working on, but um, probably need to update a bit. There's a link. Um, I need to log in. Uh, let me let me log in real quick and then I'll share my screen. Um, okay, right. <coughs> um, yeah. By the way, um, so you know, I can see that there are um, that the uh, the uh, wash projects are still uh, streaming into the uh, into the news feed, which is pretty cool since it's uh, connected to the GitHub. Uh, anyway, so the um, the stories, I think. There may even be a better link than that one, right? Let's see. So if you go to release three and you go to story list, right? So I think this is actually even a better list. And I'll just paste it again. Okay. Um, well there's the stories and there's oh no, that's right. And then the epics. 
That's the one that you like better, right, Giovanni? Yeah, it's... I mean, it's banded. Yeah. Almost okay. as bad. Okay, Balash is back. All right. Did your browser crash, Balash? Well, actually, it was my laptop, so sorry, it might happen again. Uh, yeah, shall I know. continue, or you guys started a new topic, or...? Oh, we briefly were starting to look at the stories, but uh, but I'm eager to, to hear the rest, so please... Uh, please. Okay, so what I was about to say, so uh, so you see this transition between the swimming and the crawling behavior in the uh, medians, which is an intermediate viscosity compared to agar and, to, and the water, and... The point that the, the labs are making that made these measurements is that there is a single, a simple, uh, one single underlying uh, neuro, uh, sort of like neuromuscular mechanism that underlies all these motions. And what is nice about this is that we can use this to our advantage because uh, this way we can perturb our system in a very controlled way. If you would like to do anything fancy with genetics, that we made some genetically modified worms, and then we model those genetical modifications in our system, then what would be very difficult is to really assess what, what, what did we change genetically, how to modify it. It's, it's going to be very, very complicated to make sure that what we perturb in the biological system is accurately reflected in the virtual system in the open worm. Right. But what we can do with the environment, we can just simply, well, I'm not a computer person, so I don't know how simple it is but it is well controlled to say to define an environment uh, with, with, with a certain value for viscosity. I mean, to me, that, does, that, that seems like a much simpler uh, choice to perturb a system. And if we would be able to reproduce with the open worm this transition from crawling to swimming behavior, then we would have a, a much, much stronger ground to claim that what our worm is actually doing is the same thing that the C. elegans is doing because hey that you can see that okay so there are these two basic behaviors of the C. elegans but they've got one underlying mechanism and we reproduce this underlying mechanism uh, with our model as well because you see the, uh, the same transitional behavior and I think that's going to be the, the simplest way in which we can perturb our system and uh, demonstrate that w what we have is not just an overfitted model for one particular behavior, but what we have is a, is a model that generally works well for, for C. elegans behavior. That's pretty awesome. So uh, one question on that. So yeah? the folks that are doing these actual uh, experiments, first of all, are those, are those folks doing those experiments nearby? Um, well, it was not Neta Cohen who did it, but there was definitely people in Leeds who did it. And uh, I, I, I can email you the articles, the three articles that I find on this topic. And it was two different labs, so uh, we might be able to find one of them that are happy to uh, give us their data. But um, well, I'm not sure of that, but um, you know, we, can, we can always give it a try. Yeah, so this is the question. So I mean, we will have um, knobs to turn on the viscosity um, when we've got the SPH working with the fluid mechanics. And so but we'll need to know what actually to set them to, and that suggests that, um, you know, these folks who are doing that, uh, that research have measured it. Um, yes. So, so, um, so basic numbers, you know, ballpark figures, I mean, ballpark, I mean, I guess they have to be uh, precise enough so that there's, you know, within a margin of error, we can set them correctly. Um, but, uh, yeah, so like, what's the viscosity of the auger they use? What's the viscosity of the liquid that they use? And then, and then the other piece, right, is characterizing the output. So uh, even understanding what measurement that they're taking in order to uh, tell the difference between the transition between swimming and crawling, like are they doing optical, uh, you know, pattern recognition of the basically the curve of the worm? I would expect something like that. But then the rate no, that it's, it's, it's at or well, the, the one art, well, so basically, but when I talked to Nata about it, uh, I'm I'm still in uh, I'm exchanging email with her, so I know about their method methodology, and they just annotated the data by hand. So they were just looking at it, and they saw this. It's really characteristic. She even she even showed it to me when I was down there in Leeds. And uh, if you see it, it, it's very obvious whether it's doing the swimming or crawling, and you can really see how does it look like, sort of the the in between the two forward locomotion. And the other thing that I think is important about this is that what C. elegans does. Is, is forward locomotion. If you look at its behavior, like 95% of the time, it's, it's going to go forward. And then after a while, it's going to get bored. It's going to look around, uh, sniff around in the air, and just find an attractive chemical and just go that direction. So uh, 
upward locomotion, then with that we, we uh, can account for 95% of the behavior. It's such a dominant way what C. elegans does that I think first we should do our best to get the, the forward locomotion right and then, and, then, and then see how it does in a more general setting. Nice. But I think forward locomotion should be the first thing that we that we focus on in when we compare our model with the real uh, worm. Yeah. Um, awesome. So this kind of gets back to what what are, what are we? You know, you guys. Um, I think we we all kind of uh, got together and agreed, and this kind of maybe a good transition into the stories. But we kind of agreed that we would um, we would work on the simplified version. Right of the of the C. elegans, and I'm wondering how you guys are thinking about uh, that simplified version now, um, in terms of you know what steps we we're taking towards it. So jumping back into the epics and the stories, I think that the let's see, the one that actually deals with this topic is okay. So this one is able to see the body of the worm moving, changing color, driven by the activity of the sim simulation engine, right? Okay, so this is what we're calling simplified worm, right? And, and so I guess, uh, you know, for, for Matteo, do you think that we're still on this, on this path toward these, towards these steps, albeit that we haven't really given real dates to when we think that we're, we're going to accomplish this in, in, this, uh, in this release? But um, do you think that, that these are still kind of on your radar? Um, yes, the, like all the, all the we're with uh, we're basically using uh, SPH uh, as a vehicle to basically put in place the full loop. Or basically, we have simulation getting streamed, rendered on the engine, and uh, all of this things need even for the for the simplified world. So it's a uh, let's say the first point is exactly the the. Uh, a 3D visualization in a WebGL-enabled browser. Now, in that case, this world will be streaming uh, a C Elegant, so supposedly it will be like a mesh of the C Elegant. And uh, basically, we already we we will already have all of that. It is a, a SPI, SPH task, and um, for the neurons and muscle cell changing color depending on model variables, like the underlying requirement for that is again to have an engine which can represent uh, uh, different metadata which will uh, be in the, in the model itself. So you could, uh, uh, we were discussing about this yesterday, like you can associate, for instance, in, in the case of SPH to a particle, you could associate a small particular, you could, for instance, associate the metadata of the speed of the particle, the vector, and just because you might want to show it, and, and depending on, your show on uh, the values, you could display it in, in one way or the other. So all of this stuff will be reused for the for the simplified world. The one thing that um, once we level in place in order to basically converge with the simplified worm, we will need uh, to basically have um, a model, a 3D model to, to use to represent the worm and that be uh, like we will have to decide in what for that model would be it could be a simplified mesh. It could be uh, a, a, a streaming the particles for the cuticle. Uh, uh, like in terms of functionalities, what we were um, aiming at was to have something similar to what we have in cyber. Once we have all all of this turning place, it would be a matter of deciding exactly. Okay what is the model that we want to have and uh, what kind of simulation we want. I think in that case you can cool. we'll be writing, say, solver for the neural simulation <coughs> that uses you know, integrate and fire or what other as model. add something? Yeah. It, uh, I'm, all that I agree. And one thing that uh, in terms of organization, I think that SPH stuff that we are working on at the moment with Sergey, like 
it's a subset of that simplified warm thing. So basically, all the stuff that we are doing for the ASPH, it, we, we would have to do for the simplified more. But the SPH is a subset. So I think, and, and I also think that it's a um, more reasonable deliverable, the smaller set of features, like more basic. There's no warm, it's just you're, you're showing them. So I think we should have another epic that is um, like visualize, visual, WebGL visualization of the SPH. And uh, I think we're going to be able to deliver that. While I am skeptical that we're going to be able to deliver the simplified worm uh, in, a, in a reasonable time frame. OK, let me just get this in there. Um, and um, I don't know if people agree, but I, that, that's, my, that's my feeling. I mean, the stuff that we are doing for, for this SPH, where geo visualization, we would have to do for the simplified worm anyway. So it's just a it's just a stepping stone towards the simplified worm, but if we make it a deliverable, we will probably hit it for whenever we decide. So maybe say four months, three months, two months, whatever. We have to come up with that, but we'll, we will hit that deliverable uh, while the simplified worm is much more stuff. Okay. So let me let me pause though for a minute before we we, we go into debating that one and just say. Let's go back to, to Balash and just sort of say, so I mean, you're, what you're saying there really just kind of reminds me and, and, and re-inspires me that, um, you know, that we need, to, we need to think about a holistic, uh, you know, integration here um, as we're moving forward in, the, in this release in order to get to a place where we can um, get closer to that kind of a test that you're talking about with the uh, viscosity change and behavioral change kind of a test. Um, so, um, so thank you for the contribution for thinking about it, and also for coming in and reminding us all that that is really kind of what our endpoint is. I think uh, it's extremely useful, um, and thank you as well for continuing to think about this and interact with Meta Cohen. You know, even though this is, you know, not not as much on the main line of, of what you're doing um, as you had originally thought, um, but uh, we we'll really, really appreciate it, um, and it's it's crucial. I know that. Uh, I know that all of us have wanted, you know, as as closer and closer interactions with uh, folks from the actual biology world, and I think right now you're providing a really excellent link to it. So um, really appreciate it. I think I think that's extremely important, and it's our end goal. So we we could we could partially, I mean, part of this uh, test we could apply to the simplified works, and maybe it doesn't pass it. You know. You've done a Lobner Prize where there's people putting together chatbots and they never pass the Turing test. So our simplified worm will try to pass the Turing test for the worm and it will fail. But it's perfectly normal because we are not there yet. So as we have more sophisticated simulations, it will get closer and closer. And at one stage, hopefully, it will pass it. But in order to pass it, we need to know wh what it is that we're driving to towards. So I think the stuff that Balash is working on is uh, very important, it's like paramount importance for us because it's basically going to be defining our end goal, and someone needs to think about that. Yeah. Just one more thing that I want to say because uh, Joanna, you mentioned something really important, and uh, that's about that we are, uh, uh, and that is just everything in relation to the uh, uh, simplified worm because. One thing that, that's really important, uh, I think, and I'm not even sure that everybody was uh, with that, uh, well, how to put it, but never mind. The point is, is that, for example, what I mentioned with this transition, uh, Neta Cohen's group, they constructed a model which can, uh, which demonstrates this transition between the crawling and the swimming behavior. Well, I think where our project is, is unique and where it's much, much, much more challenging is that we are adopting biological constraints, the, the connectome, the uh, conductance-based neural models. So I think initially uh, it would be much simpler just sort of to forget about all these constraints and to throw them away and just try to do a, a swimming transi uh, a swimming crawling transition. As I said, this has already been done or to do anything else. But what we are really, well, or at least what I hope to, and I hope that everybody is, uh, well, that we think about the problem the same way, is that what we would really like to demonstrate at the end is that if we take these basic biological constraints, build them into a model, then <coughs> we can have uh, a model 
uh, in which more uh, generally uh, the basic behavioral patterns of C elegance emerges because with NetEquence model